<laughs> say, I'm done. <laughs> right. So let me see. First, I introduce you human color vision and I get into the frog. So I hope at the end you say, oh, frog is kind of cute. <laughs> All right, so this is a fundamental molecule for our vision. That's the first step, right, get in. So, so it is called visual pigment. Each visual pigment comes with two parts. First, a tr transmembrane protein opsin, and which is, is encoded by a specific opsin gene. And the second uh, is known as 11 cis retinol or vitamin A1, which comes from a diet. That's it. Right? It's very simple. So today, more than 800 opsin genes have been cloned completely, and they can be classified into eight, uh, five groups. So these are used for red and green color vision, UV and violet vision. Violet and blue, we change, are used interchangeably. This one works in under moonlight or dim light conditions. So two things from here. Okay, these dots indicate the appearance of vertebrates about 630 or so million years ago. Second, our ancestor, our placental mam mammalian ancestor destroyed these two and we are not complaining them, uh, missing them. But fish and other species have all of five. They have better color visions. So today I focus only this group, show wave sensitive type one Opsin group. This is what you see if you use UV filters. That's what happens. So some animals see very differently. I don't know the species name of this one, but here you UV vision is something strike out. So flowers are not made for us, obviously. So if you want to have a subtle color vision, you don't want to have UV vision. Right, in that case, really two-tone color. Fundamentally, the molecular genetic analysis of UV vision started 2000. It's very new. It went on birds, mouse, and frog, right? So human color vision, this is the hairy animals. And here is mouse and human. Mouse has a UV vision. This number is 359414. It's a phenotype. We can determine very, very rigorously. And we also call that lambda max as a jargon in vision science. So mouse and human, it's a human and mouse, black and white. You put transmembrane 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 5 of hu uh, mouse segment into human, then evaluate the function. That's phenotype 413, nothing changed, 365, yes, it's promising, 359, 360. And now you, we can conclude from this one, okay, the difference between mouse and human vision is light on transmembrane one to three. So we want to determine which one uh, amino acid differences are responsible for it. So graduate students start doing changing, you start from mouse, put the human amino acid in transmembrane one, two, three, one by one. So he comes back, okay, nothing work. It cannot be, because that's the place something should be happening that we have seen chimeras. Eventually figure out how to do it, then mouse, if you put these seven mutations into mouse, it becomes 411. Human is 414. Reverse, we can make it to mouse pigment. So if you give me mouse pigment, we can make like a human, vice versa. So here is a rectangle indicate uh, UV sensitive pigment. You don't have to read the uh, words there. And otherwise, violet sensitive pigment. Then you infer ancestor, then we engineer them, then it determine the function, then from here you can see our ancestor had, most of them had the UV vision. 
a human ancestor lost it. So, as I told you, human ancestor developed when you compare to mouse. Seven mutations important, but you can do the same thing to the ancestor that you still need the seven. So identical seven changes make it to human from mouse, uh, sorry, ancestor. So we are going to do evolution. How do you do that? We have a seven mutations, then two makes to study entire process of evolutionary process, all possibilities, you, may, you have to study 5,040 evolutionary paths from ancestor, say 90 million years ago to today. That's what we are going to do. In practice, you have this one, ancestral mam mammalian ancestor, say zero, 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 put the stuff, putting a mutation, single mutation, double mutations, and seven mutations, you make 177, uh, 27 mutations. Combine all of this one, then you can make it to 5,040 pathways. Then we found out about 80% of them, they stop. Uh, protein doesn't work anymore. And the worst case is one particular mutation, 52 side. So if you come, that comes in first, evolution stops, forget that. Okay? Then the same thing, same mutation stop other part too. Somebody comes in, T52 F focal second, then it stops too. Evolution for me is important. Make, uh, evolutionary tree is useful for me because I can identify where mutations occur. So we can determine which mutation came first and end except this resolution is poor when evolutionary tree is not good. But T52F came at the end. It was not required, but it had to come at the end. So what happened was, well, we know why it happens at the chemical levels. T52F, it happens first. The protein becomes dehydrated and it doesn't work because T52F stops the water entrance. We can tell that chemically. So what happened up shot, the evolution occurred at 93, change occurred first. This happens in the middle of the bunch of lines. 114 happens first, then again, more or less the same. So from here we can see we studied 5,040 evolutionary trajectories, pathways. Then 1032 uh, evolutionarily was, well, sorry, structurally acceptable. From there we identified eight, right? If it works, there. Yeah. Then that had to go through functional requirement. That means our ancestor didn't like to change quick. So evolutionary change occurred very slow. That's, that's what happened here. So in summary then, this is blue, well, violet vision start coming into human ancestors between this 44, 30 million years ago. Because of the evolution, we can tell. So that's, at the, this is a story at the chromosome seven in human, but X chromosome gene duplication occurred and three amino acid change occurred at the same time, same time during 15 million years of duration. So that's all we know, and uh, we, that knowledge is pretty good, uh, because I can tell how we acquired our color vision, when, how. Let me tell you about the frog. Frog is a little bit cuter than human, in my opinion. So frog is sitting here. When I say frog, it's a very special kind of frog, clawed, African clawed frog or Western clawed frog. This is very well fed, it looks like. Tetraploid. The superstar in the frog world is this guy. This is diploid. That's kind of cute to me, it's give you a hug. Okay, ancestor and frog, black and white. If you're going to put the, you start from ancestor, put the frog transmembrane one, two, three, one, two, one, three, two, three, one, two, three, and on, right? That has been done, chimera has been made. 
So, we, so here A means ancestor, F means frog in different segments. So if you start from ancestor, put the transmembrane one, two, three, three or nine, change to four to two, that's 63 nanometer shift occurs from UV to violet sensitivity, human 414, right? Frog and human is similar. On the other hand, if you go backwards, let me see, I tried to use it. Reverse experiment, minus 63, you cannot do better than this. So I would conclude, right? Transmembrane one to three, again, is important, like human. Oh, it's simple then, right? So, ancestor, 359, frog, 423. Maybe I changed the color here. 359, so you can, I, we could identify, that was done by Yusuke, at eight amino acid sites are important to change from ancestor to frog. Three comments. So individual amino acid, they do not make much difference, but together they shift 63 nanometer change. Observation number two. So I'm going to confess I lied to you. So F, I, I implied or misled you. So if you start with ancestor A, put the F in the second transmembrane, that becomes 383, then 24 nanometer shift of card. Then if you change two and four to seven, same time, it changes 45. See, that's the place I misled you, and four to seven is doing something. The question now is what are they doing? Before that, four to seven change, it, it doesn't make any difference, but as you can see, non-additive effect, that's epistasis, is happening. Four to seven are involved in that. So you can see bigger number there too. However, when you add them up, all interaction, individual effect from four to seven, the disappear, uh, function, functional impact disappears. That's a cool part. So summary here is frog pigment evolution can be explained. I'm very careful. I use explained by eight mutations in transmembrane one, two, three. But some funny thing happened during evolution. And effect of transmembrane four to seven disappeared at the last step of evolution. So now frog, today, what we know about it. So here, I had to start from here. Black is frog ancestor, and white is uh, frog. So put the transmembrane two, then that's 383, transmembrane two and four to seven, 404. So we want to explain how it happens, then we can identify specific amino acid in four to seven. So then summary now then is actually the frog pigment evolution occurred by 12, not four additional things came in. Then again, funny thing happened during evolution, uh, effect of transmembrane four, four, four to seven disappeared at the end. So question is then what happened? So we go to study old evolutionary path, right? So that's what we're going to do. So ancestral pigment to today's visual pigment, a frog pigment, we have 12 amino acid changes. Okay, if you wanna study entire process of evolutionary process, then that's 500 million. If I say that to lab members, everybody leaves me immediately, I know that. So we had to do something else. So something else, we have to assume certain things or simplify something. Here are six transmembrane, one, two, six, six and seven together. Then these 12 mutations are sitting in there. Particularly important one is transmembrane two and three. So let me introduce you only transmembrane three. Then we are going to make assumption. 
So if you, if we make this a total four amino acid changes involved, so change three change amino acid changes, that doesn't cause any difference, one, standard error of one, right? E113D minus four goes backwards. That's essentially zero. If you put them four together, 51 nanometer shift, it's most of them, the evolution from 360 to 414. However, if these things, three amino acid change first and E113D occurs towards the end of the evolution, it's not 51, but 15. I know it's a little bit complicated here, you, you bear with me. So where did the E113D occur? Towards the end. I cannot tell you which came first in the second part. So from this one, E113D control the upper limit of lambda max shift, functional change. If I do this, by the way, okay, by the way, vertebrate ancestor uh, pigment, all of them I know today is E113. Only frog, special frogs, clawed frogs, is the D113D. In case you're wondering, in vertebrate equivalent place, E180, that's the same E's, except these frogs, D, right? So, I make this assumption, a amino acid replacement and the transmembrane changes has one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not too bad if that, if you're really worried about, I'll give you rough uh, impact at the end. So if you do that, things become simple because we don't want to deal with two of combinations, but six, that's 720 trajectories. Well, we can do this again. Total, you have to make 63 mutations, then combine them, we can make 2720 or so. During the mutagenesis analysis, we encounter this, right? One, okay. So notation, first A is ancestor, F is a frog, three, four means you, have, you start with ancestor, then put transmembrane three, four frog into ancestor. Then you notice, Everyone, everyone means nine of them contains three. Ah, easy, right? Three is doing something. Four, five, six comes in, they destroy the molecule. That's what happened. That's what I thought. So I do have a chemist uh, collaborator, theoretical chemist. So I asked, ev to ev I asked him to evaluate if we change transmembrane four, you start with transmembrane 3, A3F, that's happy, happy molecule, it causes 51 nanometer change, but it's happy. A3F is functional, put 3, 4 together. Oh, before that, what does it do? 1, 1, 3, there's a two molecules sitting in there, 110, 187. 110, 187 is uh, makes disulfide bond in a very critical part of the molecule. So what happened is transmembrane four comes in, mutation comes in, then this two parts are split. So disulfide bond breaks and it becomes non-functional, unstable and non-functional. That means four is doing, getting rid of three. Somehow system doesn't like four, so uh, three, four destroys it. Not five and six. Well, four does it by itself in its own way, then how about f transmembrane five and six? What they do, this is a very special part. There's a certain space required, retinal binding pocket. Then when you have put in four or five or together, what happened is the space shrink, then vitamin A1 cannot come in, they cannot make a visual pigment. Okay, that's what frog ancestor did. So three is something frog ancestor didn't like, so 
eventually evolutionarily acceptable pathway, no, sorry, structurally not acceptable and stop the pathway. That's total end up acceptable path is 38. If you, have, you don't have any problem, it's 120, which is given by when transmembrane two changes first. So who comes first is so critical in evolution of this color vision. So, okay, so what's wrong with three? I, I told you already A3F, it's not, it's a happy molecule, but somehow animals didn't like it. So what's the problem? The comparison is A2F, that's a happy molecule, and evolution, evolutionary path works every time. So the difference is, uh, you can see here, like when you saw humans, they wanted to move slowly. They don't like a big change, but A3F gives you biggest change you can Im imagine. So that's the only difference. So A to F represent the middle line, the slow changes. So suppose you take A to F as a representative of frog evolutionary path, then we can have a, this kind of relationship, evolutionary steps, right? Two, four, two, five, one, six, four, three. Then Q thing is transmembrane four, five, six is sitting in front of transmembrane three, in particular E113D. So somehow this is like, if you like a Hollywood, this or like a Terminator, they sit waiting there and the E113 comes, they destroy it, right? I don't want to say more because you can imagine something else. So here, without any interaction among or between transmembranes, amino acid effect is small. Transmembrane within a interaction within transmembrane two and three are big, otherwise small. But if you put them order now, two, five, one, six, four, three, um, here. Then there's of course the, the loss between uh, epistasis or non-additive effect between transmembrane, among transmembrane start working and evolution move slow. So this one, amino acid effect is not important. Essentially interaction of amino acids are important so you can trace this epistasis alone, effect of, of epistasis alone explain the whole evolution. So if you're interested in understanding the effect of transmembrane four to seven, then we can study transmembrane one to three, what's missing, right? That's what happens, what's wrong with it? At the end, they have to really jump. They didn't like it to begin with, so that's not used. That's my interpretation. Now human, evolutionary process is very similar. Both of them wanted to go slow. So how about human transmembrane four to seven? To do that again, you want to explain these pathways with transmembrane one to three epistasis that explain perfectly well. So they didn't really need to use transmembrane four to seven. So I say, whoa, frog is far more sophisticated than human ancestor. So, so here's my conclusion. Then first, actual evolution of frog pigment occurred by 12 mutations throughout the pigment molecule. Let's see. Very, very strange thing is transmembrane four to seven. Well, this is not strange. Force the system works or evolves slowly. And effect of transmembrane four to seven 
disappeared at the last evolutionary step. This is very strange to me. And if you saw this chimera experiment between transmembrane one to three and one to three exchanges, we can explain frog pigment evolution by eight mutations in transmembrane one to three. Right? That's all. I presented evidence, the hardcore mutagenesis evidence we can explain, but actually evolution happened 12. So if you didn't study evolution, this is the first time, right? Evolution, I thought, evolution is required, evolutionary analysis is required to understand the whole picture. But still, I have to leave you with this question marks. I don't know what the heck is that mean. So that's my conclusion of my talk here. Sorry, leaving you with question mark. <laughs>